Hey friends, welcome to the Redeemer Sessions. My name is Thomas, and I'm so glad to have you tuning in with us. I hope it's been a good weekend for you so far. Really glad that we get to share some time together this afternoon for the Redeemer Sessions. The Redeemer Sessions are where we aim to have reasonable and relevant conversations about God, the church, and Christianity as we seek to see Redeemer Queens Park started as a new church community in Northwest London. We're in a collection of talks called Jesus Changes Everything as we're having a look at this leader named Paul and how he worked with and loved and cared for a new church in Philippi in Greece. The book of Philippians is in the Bible. It's in the New Testament. You could look that up now. We're in Philippians chapter 1. As we get into it for this afternoon, I want to begin by introducing the topic of prayer. I meet some people that pray, but they're not sure who they pray to. They're not even really sure when they should pray or what they should pray about. Some people pray to a great spiritual being or some type of force that's out there. And I think that's a good thing that we're trying to do in our hearts. We're acknowledging there's something or someone out there that we want to connect with and we want to share our life with. But I think that's getting there, but it's not all the way there. I think the Bible provides a really clear picture of what prayer is like. Hopefully this talk could be an introduction for anyone interested in getting into prayer, but maybe not that quite familiar with how a prayer actually works. Very few Christians are happy with how we pray. Some Christians are happy with how much we read our Bibles. Other Christians are happy with how much we might spend serving our neighbor, but very few are happy with how much they pray. Sometimes we don't know what to pray for. This is for all of us. Should we pray for health? Should we pray for happiness? Sometimes we don't know how prayer works. We pray for some things to happen, and they don't, while we pray for other things not to happen, and they do. What about you when it comes to prayer? What is the role of prayer in your life? Do you pray? What do you pray for? Who do you pray to? When do you pray? What do you pray about? I want to enter into this uh, idea this afternoon of learning to pray. And specifically, I want to talk to you about the theme of peace through prayer. Prayer is essential to what Paul is doing in Philippians, but first, what is prayer in general? Prayer is simply talking to your Creator. It's asking and answering. It's saying how you feel, and it's listening for a response. Prayer is based on this fundamental belief that there is a Creator that's there, and we can know Him personally as our Creator and our Redeemer, as our Savior, yet our Judge. And I think of prayer as communication in any relationship. Sometimes there's um, seasons of, of quick, short, back and forth communication. Other times there's sitting down and really pouring out our hearts and really sharing where we are and what we're feeling. But like any relationship, a relationship that goes a long time without communication eventually suffers from all sorts of disruptions. So it is with God and us. Prayer is how we communicate with God. Prayer is how we express our faith to Him. We believe that He's there. We want to His help in our lives. We need to share where we are and what we're feeling with Him and invite Him to work in our midst. Well, just like with any communication, if I weren't texting my wife, if I weren't calling my wife, if I weren't sitting down on the couch just to really share where we are and what's going on, and it's not just me, if I, if I weren't only to share my side, but if I weren't to listen, well, you can just imagine the disruption that would come. You can think of any friendship that you have as well. Similar principles apply. But here's how prayers are being worked out in Philippians. This leader named Paul, who's helped start this new church in Philippi, well, he is praying to God to work in their midst and on their behalf. Because the spiritual health of a city is directly tied to the prayer life of the church that is in that community. The spiritual and social healing of the community and the world depends on the prayers going through the church. Those are some massive ideas. And let's get to this place where we ultimately find peace through prayer. I need to share with you three principles of prayer first. How does prayer even work? Well, consider with me. First, the Bible teaches us that prayer is essential for spiritual development. 
Prayer is essential for spiritual development. Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 10 is where we see Paul working some of this out. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may, may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of of God. Prayer is essential for spiritual development. Consider how he's doing it here. In, in verse 9, he says that your love may abound more and more. This pastor cares for this flock of people and he wants them to have a heart for God. In verse 9, there it is with a heart of love so that they could discern, so that when they face all kinds of decisions they have to make or dilemmas of leadership, they may be able to look at it with a heart of love, and be able to understand what the way of Jesus is in every situation. In verse 10, that you may approve of what is excellent. He wants them to be attuned to true beauty so that they can make wise choices. We're all going to be attuned to something or to someone. Paul wants them to attuned to God. Pastor Paul is praying that the fundamental longings and desires of their hearts would be changed by God. A change at the heart level is what we're talking about. Paul is asking God that they would love the right things, that they would hate the right things, and that they would want the right things. Now, follow me here. True Christianity springs from a heart of desire for God and not any sort of ritual or dead routine or religion. Christianity is not about doing things in a ritualistic way. Religion is mere ritual without a love for God. Ritual is pretty much useless unless your heart is changed by God. And Paul is praying that they would have the mind of God at work in their minds and the love of God at work in their hearts. He's praying that their nature would be changed. Now the book of Proverbs provides a startling verse that illustrates this very idea of the necessity of a changed nature. Proverbs has a graphic illustration about this, and it goes like this. The dog returns to its vomit. The dog returns to its vomit. What does this mean? Well, this means you can treat a dog like a family member. You can spend lots of money on the dog. You can buy lots of things for the dog, and on and on and on. You can prepare a meal in the evenings for the dog. You can give the dog a name, and you could even give the dog its own bedroom in your house or your flat. Yet, at the end of the day, you can dress up the dog, you can treat the dog differently, you can style the dog differently, but the nature of the dog has not changed, and no matter how much you treat a dog like a human, the dog is still a dog. The dog will never sit in the back garden with you, smoke a pipe, and talk politics because the nature of the dog has not changed. Here's the point. You can change some of your habits. You can change your form. You can change your style. But if you don't change the nature, then nothing will essentially change. And Paul is saying prayer is essential for spiritual development. He prays that their nature would change, that they would know God in truth. Verse 11, that they would be filled with the fruit of righteousness, something that comes from God as he puts it in our hearts. When we pray for people, this is the most important thing that we could pray for people. Yes, we want to pray that God would be at work in people's lives, meeting their real needs, but the ultimate thing we want to pray for is that God would change our hearts and the hearts of others. We are praying that God would take a human heart that is naturally resistant to him and make it to love him. We are inviting people to come to Christ. We are depending when we are inviting people to come to Christ, we are depending on God to change the heart. We pray that God would give us new hearts and new desires. We pray that God would give new hearts and new desires to other people. We are asking God to help us hate sin and to love the things of God as much as we ask it for other people. So just as important as talking to people about God is talking to God about people. And that's why prayer is essential for spiritual development. In our own lives, 
we're literally praying for our souls as we're bringing our hearts to God. We're talking about where we are and how we're feeling. We're also doing this as we come to God on behalf of others and we ask God to be at work in their lives, to develop their spiritual lives by ultimately changing the desires of the heart. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. Prayer is God's means of providing for your needs, both physical and spiritual. Do you ever think of it like that, though? Prayer is God's means of providing for your needs, both physical and spiritual. Let me show you from the text. Could you flip over to Philippians chapter 4? Let's have a brief look at verses 6 and 7. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The assumption here is that we are to present all of our anxieties to God. So a ridiculous question in these weeks that we're in. Do you have any stress or any anxiety? The Bible has something we should do with that. We should bring it to God who created us, who wants to redeem us, and who desperately cares for us. Prayer is God's means of providing for your spiritual needs. Let me show you this. Here's a test for knowing what we should pray for. We should pray for anything that we are anxious about. Sometimes we feel like we shouldn't pray for the little things that we're facing, though. We shouldn't pray for a job interview. We shouldn't pray for a different, difficult Zoom call that we're facing. We shouldn't pray for our emergence from lockdown. We will feel like we have these smaller things in our lives that, that don't feel absolutely massive. Maybe it's a, a frayed relationship or a, a parenting dynamic or situation. But the assumption in, 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 in oftentimes when we think like that is that we actually don't think God is good at multitasking. But God is marvelous at multitasking. He can handle anything we bring to Him. We th sometimes we think God is so busy trying to work out world peace that He really doesn't need to be bothered with our children's school assignments. But even there, we can bring God those things because He's marvelous at multitasking and He can handle anything that we bring to Him. So what should you pray for? You should pray for anything that gives you stress or anxiety. I think that helped just about all of us go from not knowing how we should go about this to having a long, long, long list of things we ought to be talking to God about. There's an interesting word picture um, for what happens if you do this. If you go to your Creator and if you talk to your Creator about what you're feeling, and what you're feeling burdened by and wrestling with in your heart, an interesting word picture here, that the love of Christ, it will stand guard over your heart. Now, it's interesting to consider, Paul's actually writing this from a prison cell, and we, he would have had a physical guard chained to him at all times. And he's probably just sitting there thinking, man, it's, it's actually as if the love of Christ were standing guard over you, where nothing's going to happen to you outside of the oversight of this loving guard. Prayer is also God's means of providing for your physical needs, though. So Paul depends on prayer for spiritual things as much as he does on, on physical things. Uh, chapter 1, verse 19. We actually glanced at this last week, but we come back to it now. Um, Philippians 1, 19. For I know that through your prayers, those are important words, through your prayers, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance or for my salvation. Now think with me here. Paul is praying, I will be delivered because you pray. God wants to work in the world through the prayers of his people. The loving father wants to work out many things in the, son, in, in the lives of his sons and his daughters that he loves. But he has agreed somehow that he is going to work on behalf of the prayers and requests of other children on behalf of other children. So when God wants to do something in the world, he often puts it in the hearts of his people to pray. Now, just an illustration might be helpful in even thinking about what this looks like. 
Um, just imagine if, if, my son, if my son Shepherd were to come to me and he were to desperately want um, 10 pounds and he were asking me for him and asking him, if I wanted to give my son 10 pounds, there are two ways I can go about doing it. One is I could just leave 10 pounds in his room and he could wake up in the morning and find the 10 pounds. It came from me as his father. He is, he is the child. He, he doesn't know how to access an ATM um, cash point machine. He, he, he has no means of really accessing 10 pounds on his own. The only way he's coming into 10 pounds is if I choose to give it to him. I could also, instead of just leaving it in his room for him to discover it, I could also invite him deeper into relationship with me where I say, son, I have this 10 and I want to give it to you, but I want you to ask me for it. Then what's going on there? As a son looks at a father and asks for something that the father has and wants to give when the son asks and the father says, of course, I love you so much. Let me give this to you. Well, that asking and answering, that, that looking and that waiting, it deepens the relationship. And friend, that is so much of what God wants to do with us in prayer. Not that he necessarily gives us everything we want the way we want it, but because he loves us and he cares for us, and he wants to draw us deeper into that relationship with him. But we may uh, get jammed up here. Some of us get to, you know, worried about issues of God's sovereignty. Well, if God is sovereign over all things, if God has a perfect plan, why should we even waste our time praying? You might hear it go like this. Does God know the day that you'll die? Uh, yes. Has he appointed that day that you're going to die? Yes, he has. Um, can you do anything to change that day that you're going to die? No. Then why do you eat? Well, you eat because eating is God's apportioned ways of living. So then we might want to ask the stupid question. Well, then if you don't eat and you die, then would that be the day that God appointed for you to die? The point is to quit asking stupid questions and to eat. So many times for us, we need to quit worrying about the mechanics of how this is going to work and the contingencies of what else could happen and get on asking God for what we need. We know that God will give power and provision when his people pray. So if this is true, then just an honest question that I've been having to ask myself this week that all of us need to ask ourselves this afternoon. Why is God the last place we go when we have a stress or a need? For many people, myself included, we'll call friends, we'll call a parent, we'll read books, we'll stress out, but we won't go to God. How ridiculous are we? Why don't we go to God when things come up, both for our spiritual and our physical needs? Because God is not surprised by us. God is ultimately not disappointed in us. He knows who we are. He knows what we need. The Father desires a relationship with His children, and He invites us into prayer to draw us deeper into that abiding with Him. So when you are stressed about a decision, you can lean on God. This is so practical for your life. Here's one way to go about this. You can go to God. You can tell God what you're stressed about. You can tell God that you need to make a decision and you need any information from Him that will have. You have some time to wait on Him to act. And then you just make a decision without worrying about it because you went to God, your loving Father, and you waited on Him. Finally, friend, prayer is essential to personal peace. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. These verses are so important that we're actually coming back to them in a few weeks to reflect on how to overcome anxiety that I know we all feel loads of. But to Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, specifically on prayer today, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Friend, you are commanded not to worry about your anxieties, but to leave them with God. Now, some of us need to think about what we do in the midst of our troubles. God invites us to bring them to Him. Now, I need to tell you, sometimes God doesn't give us specifically what we're asking for, but it doesn't mean He has not heard what we're praying about. God answers all of our prayers with the information that He has about our lives, the lives of others, and what's ultimately best for us in the end. 
Remember, Paul is praying for prison. He wants to get out, but he doesn't. God doesn't release him right away. God answers his prayer with a no, not right now. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul prayed multiple times for this thorn to be taken from his flesh, this affliction that was set up on his life. And God said to him in the midst of that, No, my grace is sufficient for you. My power will be made perfect in your weakness. But prayer is essential to personal peace because all of us have stress and worry and anxiety that we desperately need help with. We can go to God and we can share our lives with Him. And sometimes we might not find the necessary relief that we were expecting, but we will find peace for our souls. So in summary, Prayer is essential for your spiritual development. Prayer is God's means of providing for your needs, both physical and spiritual, and prayer is essential to personal peace. Prayer is, for the church, our greatest responsibility and our most neglected opportunity. It is is the one thing that determines whether or not our ministry and our lives will be effective. It is the key to all of our spiritual effectiveness in the world. And the evangelization evangelization of the world ultimately hangs on the prayers of the church. Samuel Chadwick said, this is so helpful for me, it's been in front of me this last week. The one concern of our enemy is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, nothing from prayerless work or prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, he mocks at our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. Your spiritual development, physical and spiritual provision, and personal peace depend on prayer. So if this is true, why do we do so many things instead of praying? Some questions to jog our hearts as I bring this talk to a close. Do you pray? When do you pray? In times of trouble? In times of peace? Or at all times? Who do you pray to? Some mystical being that is out there? or your creator and redeemer who's revealed in God's word, the Bible. What do you pray about? The deep secret of prayer is that what we pray for often reveals where our lives really are. Are we praying for security? Are we praying for provision all the time? Could that actually reveal that that's what our life is really all about? Are we praying for our kids? Are we obsessed with our kids and our prayers and we can't find ourselves praying for anything else? Well, it's possible that could reveal our lives are our children. Paul has already said that for me to live is Christ. And Paul's connection to Jesus Christ changes what he asks for. What do your prayers reveal about you? I've had to spend some time this last week thinking about that for me. Sometimes we're asking God to keep our lives from collapsing under our definition of life. And that's often evidence that we actually need to convert or change to a new definition of life. And Jesus changes everything, including how we pray. Jesus came to give his life as a sacrifice for our sins. He willfully went to the cross after praying in the Garden of Gethsemane for this to change. But God, knowing what was best for the world, ultimately gave a no to that prayer from Jesus So Jesus went to the cross and he willfully gave his life as a sacrifice for our sins. When we think about that, that melts our hard hearts down and ultimately changes us. And it brings gold out of the hardness of our hearts where we can pray in every situation. Thinking about the gospel helps us to become a praying people. And we find through this that prayer is essential for our personal peace. Just a few uh, concluding applications for us as we land. The limitations in prayer are not on Jesus. The limitations in prayer are on us. Our lack of prayer reveals that we often underestimate what God can do. In John chapter 6, Jesus stands with his followers and asks them what, he's go- what he should do. In John 6, Jesus is standing with a multitude of people that are desperately hungry. They've been, they've been listening to Jesus teach The followers of Jesus have been sticking with him for some time. And in this situation, Jesus looks at his followers and he says, what should we do? And the followers freeze in the moment. They don't know what to do. And then the text says, Jesus, knowing what he planned to do, 
he fed 5,000 men plus women and children, and he sent his followers into the crowds to collect the leftovers. There were 12 baskets at the end, and Jesus hands each follower a basket of leftovers. And the point of the story is to ask. Ask. In that moment, the followers should have asked Jesus to provide for people, and they just froze in the moment, and they didn't know what to do. Friend, God is more willing and able to do what we could ever ask or imagine if we would simply ask. If we would just trust that God is willing, we would never go wrong. Second, when we ask, we should ask God for huge things because huge things honor God. Alexander the Great was once asked by one of his generals if he would pay for his daughter's wedding. Now, this general had been faithful for, to Alexander for all of Alexander's life, and Alexander said, sure, just go talk to my treasurer. The general goes and talks to the treasurer and asks for an exorbitant amount of money. The treasurer goes back to Alexander the Great, and he says, you will not believe this. He asked for this amount of money, expecting Alexander to explode only to find Alexander smile. And he said, give it to him. The treasurer freaked out. Why in the world would we ever give your, one of your generals this much money? And Alexander said, because in asking this, for, for asking for this huge amount of money, he has honored me in saying that I was both rich and generous. And that brings me honor. Give him what he asks for. Friends, when we go to God and we ask God for huge things, real spiritual provision. When we ask God to be at work in the physical lives of our friends around us, that brings honor to God. It assumes that God is rich and it assumes that God is generous and wants to work in the world. We should ask God for huge things because it honors God. What would your life be like if you came to God in simple faith and just asked him to work? Finally, you should pray because God cares for you. The verse that's been ringing in my head every night as I've laid down to go to sleep this week is 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Chapter 4, verse 7 here. The peace of God can rule in your hearts. It's the knowledge of God that he is with you and he cares for you that changes everything in prayer. In prayer. The peace of God that comes from knowing Jesus Christ is what changes everything. And many people approach God with a feeling that God is angry or disappointed with them. But Jesus Christ has removed the barrier of sin that separates us from God. Now we can hold on to Jesus as Jesus is our life. And we can pray to him. Let's do that now. Loving Father, we thank you for Jesus that's removed the barrier of sin that separates us from you and who has allowed access to you. Father, we thank you for the way to you, and that's Jesus. And we thank you for prayer, this everyday way of communicating with you, just like it was any other relationship. Father, we pray that you would help us to become a praying people. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, thanks so much for tuning in to the Redeemer session. There's more to come next week. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to us at hello at RedeemerQP.com. Thanks so much for tuning in with us. God bless you.